Hey everyone, Vortex here, and today I'm going to talk about what happened to the tribes of Hyrule after the Great Flood occurred. This theory is quite complex and it involves multiple tribes, so I'm going to start from the very beginning. Sometime after Ocarina of Time, Ganondorf found a way to escape his imprisonment and return to Hyrule. In the backstory of the Wind Waker, it is claimed that no hero appeared when Ganondorf broke free, since every tread of demise must be answered with the appearance of the chosen hero and the reincarnation of the goddess Hylia, it seems more likely to me that the hero did in fact appear during the Great Flood. His hero was simply not able to defeat Ganon and was thus not recorded in history. He was simply forgotten. This unknown hero likely followed the exact same route the hero of Winds did, but he was not able to defeat Ganondorf. The sages of Earth and Wind from this era were awakened by him and they still powered the Master Sword long after the hero's demise. Since the hero was defeated, there would be no one to stop Ganondorf. What exactly happened is unclear, but what we do know is that the people of Hyrule begged the goddesses to stop Ganondorf, and this resulted in the Great Flood. The Great Flood was the end of Hyrule. The entire land was flooded by an endless torrent. Among each tribe were a few chosen ones who were warned of the imminent destruction of their land. They were instructed to flee to the highest points in the kingdom. Some of the tribes adapted almost instantly. The Kokiri, for example, were changed by the Great Deku Tree into the lightweight Korok. The Zora eventually evolved into the Rito, and the Goron and the Hylians survived simply by relocating. But what happened to the Gerudo is unknown. Since the Gerudo are not inherently evil, as shown by Nabaru being a sage, I think they were among those warned by the goddesses. If we take a look at the map of the Great Sea, you can see a few landmarks that correspond with the map from Ocarina of Time. Among these are Kokiri Forest, Death Mountain, Kakariko Village, Lake Hylia, and the Gerudo Fortress. So let's start with what happened to the Kokiri, as they were impacted the least. The Kokiri were able to stay in their woods, as they were granted protection by their new Great Deku Tree. The Deku Tree was able to transform the Kokiri almost instantly into the Korok to adjust them to their new homes. They were able to transform for a few reasons. The Great Deku Tree no longer had a need for them to appear as humanoids, since the Hero of Time was no longer among them. Before that, the Kokiri had to be relatable for the hero, so the Kokiri took the shape of children. This form would no longer be suitable for travel across the sea. Instead, their new shape of the Korok would allow them to fly across the sea using the power of the winds. You might be wondering how the Korok were able to leave the forest without dying. In Ocarina of Time, it is said that any Kokiri who leaves the forest meets an unfortunate fate. This should be seen as a safety warning. The Kokiri are fragile and have no ability to fight. If a Kokiri leaves the forest, they might be killed without the protection of the Great Deku Tree, and therefore they will eventually die if they do not return. This still holds true for the Korok and the Wind Waker. Since the Korok no longer interact with humans, they grew fearful of them. This is why they shy away so much from Link when you first meet them. They are, however, still the same spirits of the Kokiri they once were. The Korok would also no longer need homes in the same way they did as the Kokiri, so they simply abandoned them. The Korok claimed that the Forbidden Woods were once their former home. You can still find remnants of the old Kokiri civilization in the second dungeon. There are quite a few hollowed out trees visible in the dungeon, which look very similar to the houses in Ocarina of Time. There's also quite a few doors marked by the Kokiri symbol. Despite the change in appearance, the Korok would also take over the role as housing the Sage of Forest and the Sage of Wind. This means the ancestor that Makar refers to is not literal. Fado is simply a spirit that was created far before Makar was. To support this, Makar at some point says, This instrument is the one the Great Deku Tree gave to me on the day of my birth. This implies that the Deku Tree was aware that Makar would become the new Wind Sage. This could mean two things. The Deku Tree sensed Makar's fate, or he was aware that the previous Sage was killed and created a new spirit for the new Wind Sage. All the tribes fled to higher grounds, with the exception of the Goron, since they were already located at the highest peaks of that mountain. They were not urged to flee, and instead tried to maintain their current way of life. The Great Sea, however, proved to be a very difficult environment for the Gorons. Some fans speculate that the Goron in the Wind Waker might have perished during the Flood. I disagree. The Great Flood itself would not have been an issue. While Gorons depicted in Majora's Mask are unable to tolerate water, they are actively seen bathing and enjoying the water in Twilight Princess. One Goron was even shown to be able to hold his breath indefinitely. Regardless of water survival, they were already on the highest mountains in Hyrule to begin with. If the Flood was what killed them, then all of the other tribes should be dead too. Something else must have been responsible for their disappearance. 
The Goron have a very particular way of living. The flooding of Hyrule changed that drastically. The Goron could no longer trade by carrying goods over land. Instead, they were forced to learn how to sail, something they were likely completely unprepared for. Shipbuilding and sailing would be a completely new concept for the Gorons in Hyrule, and it would prove difficult to adjust. While they could remain living in isolation and not trade with other islands, they simply were not able to do that. The Goron lifestyle heavily depends on trading, as seen in Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, Twilight Princess and the Oracle of Ages. The Gorons would prefer to live somewhere where trade would still be possible and their way of life would remain the same. But not all of the Gorons are gone from the Great Sea. The traveling merchants you encounter are disguised Goron. They claim to be from a faraway place. If you use the Deku Leaf to blow wind at them, you'll reveal their face for a moment. Why do they disguise themselves? It's almost like they don't want people to recognize they are Gorons, but why would they want that? One possibility is that the Gorons did something that made the other species hate them and it forced them to leave. That could very well be the case. I think this is connected to the Zora and the reason why we find them, or better said their descendants, on that mountain's Dragon Roost Island. The Zora and Ocarina of Time are freshwater creatures, meaning they can only survive in rivers and lakes with a low salt level. The Great Sea is everything but that. Nothing is able to survive in it besides monsters and the fishmen. While the Zora can live on land for extended periods of time, they have to return to the water at some point. The Zora would be quickly killed off if they would swim in the sea for long periods of time. The Zora would thus facing mass extinction. The Zora, even with the salt sea, would still be able to swim to the bottom of the ocean, where Hyrule was hidden. To prevent the Zora from finding out about the fate of the kingdom, the goddesses intervened. This would also prevent the Zora from being wiped out due to the water changes. The Zora are part of the three blessed tribes that serve under the minor deities of Hyrule. Hyrule Historia claims that the guardian spirits of the pearls are descendants from the Deku Tree, Fulvagia and Jabu Jabu. It's not a coincidence that these deities correspond with the Kokiri, Goron and Zora respectively. The Zora were thus considered to be worthy of intervention. Their surviving Zora were altered in shape and became known as Cerito. Their guardian deity Jabun left for the seas, as he no longer was able to watch over his people. Cerito, as beings of the sky, were sent to live with the sky spirit Valu in Death Mountain. Sometime following Ocarina of Time, it was discovered that Volvagia, the ancient Goron deity, had a descendant. Whether this descendant was born during Volvagia's resurrection or before that is unknown. Volvagia's descendant Velu was not corrupted and he settled with the Goron, being revered like its ancestor once was. Velu, however, was a sky spirit and not affiliated with fire like the Gorons were. He was still honored, however, and the remnants of this can be seen in Dragon Roost Cavern. The Rito started to revere Velu as well. The scales from Velu were used to grow wings on the Rito, as they were not able to naturally grow these. And with these wings, they were able to take to the sky. The Goron grew resentful over the long years, angered by the gods. Why did they help the Zora but abandon the Gorons in their time of need? The Gorons had nowhere to go, they were isolated by an endless ocean. They had no possibility to trade, as their heavy products were too cumbersome to be transported by air or water. The Goron felt like they were being punished for their kindness. The Rito, who had received blessings from the goddesses, were now on their turf, even claiming their guardian patron as their own. This had to stop. The Gorons decided to confront Arito and reclaim their lands and their guardian deity. The Goron, who values strength above all, challenged the frail Rito, knowing full well that the Rito would not be able to match their raw power. They forcefully tried to remove the Rito from their mountain, but this time, Valu intervened. He exiled the Gorons and sent them in rafts and boats to look for new lands to live in. He then became the new official guardian deity of the Rito and allowed them to make use of the empty Goron city. He knew that one day, a Rito child would be crucial in protecting the Great Sea. He bestowed the Rito with the pearl that had previously belonged to the Goron. Remnants of the Goron society can still be seen in Dragon Roost Island. There are many bomb flowers scattered across the island, just like they were in Ocarina of Time. The bomb flowers require specialized care and soil, so they can only grow on Death Mountain. At the entrance of Dragon Roost Cavern, there are multiple statues that look like Goron. There are also various murals within Dragon Roost Cavern, depicting either Volvagia or Valu. Notably, the background music that plays in Dragon Roost Cavern is a remix of the Dongo's Cavern. Along the wall of the volcano crater is a statue-like structure that resembles the giant Dongo skull found in the Dongo's Cavern. But where did the exiled Goron go? I believe they sailed to the lands that would later become known as New Hyrule. The merchants claim to have sailed on their rafts from very far away in order to reach the Great Sea. In Spirit Tracks, there is a Goron village in the Fire Realm where many Goron live. 
since the Incan Zelda from the era of the Great Sea also reached New Hyrule by boat, it's not too unlikely that the Gorons did the same many centuries before them. They, however, still carry their shame with them. In fear of being recognized during their travels, they cover their faces. The last tribe, and in my opinion, one of the more interesting ones, also faced extinction following the Great Flood. Due to Ganondorf's defeat, the Gerudo tribe no longer was forced to follow his doctrine. Instead, they could focus their efforts on rekindling their relationship with the Kingdom of Hyrule. Under the leadership of Nabaru and Avail, the Gerudo were able to rebuild their lands and reputation, and they were no longer avoided by the rest of Hyrule. This all came to an end when the goddesses flooded the land. The Gerudo were warned beforehand, and they fled to the highest point in their country, Gerudo Fortress. The Gerudo Fortress was shown to be an elevated platform. Likely what we encounter as the Forsaken Fortress was the tallest portion of the Gerudo Fortress that survived the flood. This is supported by Tetra claiming that there are all sorts of strange rumors about this place. What I do know is that long ago it used to be a hideout of a no good group of pirates we used to compete with. The Gerudo could have become pirates after the Great Flood, similar to their Terminian counterparts. Survival in the Great Sea proved difficult and the Gerudo quickly went back to their old ways, thievery and murder. There was no food to be found in the waters, so the only form of survival for the Gerudo was to plunder ships and islands. This put them yet again at odds with the Hylians. At some point after this, the Gerudo vanished completely. They either had no way of expanding the tribe, or they were hunted down and murdered. The fortress they left behind was later rediscovered by their lost king. Ganondorf seems surprisingly bitter about the fate of his people. He laments about the suffering his people endured during the era of the Hero of Time. He says, My country lay within a vast desert. When the sun rose into the sky, a burning wind punished my lands, searing the world. And when the moon climbed into the dark of night, a frigid gale pierced our homes. No matter when it came, the wind carried the same thing, death. But the winds that blew across the green fields of Hyrule brought something other than suffering and ruin. I coveted that wind, I suppose. While Ganondorf in Ocarina of Time had his eyes only set on the Triforce in Hyrule, he has since been able to see matters more sensibly during his years of exile. He does not simply want to conquer Hyrule, he wants to create a better future for his people as well. Ganondorf also realizes why he's so obsessed with the Triforce. He realizes that he has no control over his fate. It was something that had been foretold since birth. Even death and imprisonment could not change his fate. He remarks, It can only be called fate, that here I would again gather the tree with the crests. He doesn't even seem to want to harm either Zelda or Link. He had many opportunities to kill either one of them, yet he refuses to do so despite knowing they are reincarnations of the forces destined to oppose him. He only wants to make his wish, a wish to return Hyrule to its former state. However, his people are no longer among the living, and his initial plan to conquer Hyrule and give his people a better life was no longer possible. All that was left for Ganondorf was to end the cycle, by either making his wish to rule Hyrule or through death. In the end, he failed again, but this time he laughed, as the last of the Gerudo was finally freed from his fate. So in short, the tribes of Hyrule all handled the Great Flood differently. The Hylians and the Gerudo survived by fleeing to the mountaintops. The Kukiri and the Zora had to transform into more fitting shapes to survive, and the Deku and the remaining Sheka are never witnessed again, making it likely that they didn't survive the flooding or died shortly after. Hey everyone, thanks for watching, and if you like this video, check out some of my other Zelda stuff.